Welcome, Ms. Karen, and welcome to all those who have um, called in uh, via our conference call. Uh, we have another three minutes, and we will begin our study today. Uh, while you wait, uh, today we'll be studying um, Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 11, or chapter 15, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. Luke 15 11 to 32. Welcome, Ms. Conrad. Welcome, Mr. Quartz. Welcome, Miss Barbara Mallory. Hello, Father. How are you? I'm doing okay. How are all of you doing? Welcome, Miss Tolson. Thank you. Hello, this is Susan Jennifer. Welcome, Miss Jennifer. Um, we have another two minutes, and um, we will um, do a housekeeping, and then we will continue. Okay. All right. Welcome, Mama Louise. Welcome. Thank you. How are you doing today? I'm surviving. <laughs> yes. And to all of you, uh, my brothers and sisters who have um, called in using the Facebook Live, um, welcome to you. We have another minute, and we will uh, officially begin. And so while you wait, um, please take up your Bible. We will be studying the Gospel according to St. Luke. And we will study chapter 15. We'll begin from verse 11, and we will go all the way to 32. Okay? All right. Luke 15, 11 to 32. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, so before we start, um, remember I am going to uh, put everybody on the conference call. Uh, there's a lot of people on the conference call. Um, there will be a lot of feedback. So I'm going to put everybody uh, on mute. If you have a question, uh, you can unmute yourself by dialing star 5. And once you dial star 5, you should be able to ask your question. Yes, welcome Pamela, welcome Miss Hilda, and all of you who are calling in. Thank you all for um, calling in today, okay? So I will go ahead, as I have welcomed you all in the conference call and those joining us on Facebook Live, I will go ahead now and put you all on, a, on mute, okay? Remember, if you have a question at the end, you can unmute yourself by dialing star 5. Yes, that's at the end, right? Yes. All right. All right. All right, good evening again to you um, on this Holy Week, uh, this Holy Wednesday, as we prepare for the most beautiful celebration of our church, as we, in a short while tomorrow, will enter into the Triduum, the three most wonderful, most powerful days of our celebration. 
where on Thursday, together we will celebrate the Lord instituting the greatest gift that we have, the greatest prayer we have, the Eucharist. And then on Friday, the Lord will pay the ultimate price for our sins. And uh, he, through his passion, his death, on a Good Friday, uh, we will gain salvation. And then on Saturday, the vigil, we will celebrate the reason for our being a Christian, right? That the Lord Jesus Christ went down into the tomb and he rose on the third day. And then, hallelujah, will be our song, beginning from Saturday night into Easter Sunday proper. And so, this is the three, doom, the three most important days of our celebration. And we know this is unique. For many of you, this is the first time you will not be in the church physically celebrating the three, doom. That's okay. God understands. You know, the Archbishop and his council made the decision that we keep you at home because we believe that by you staying home, you are lessening the burden of all the nurses and doctors and all those who work hard to keep us safe. That's why we stay home. We stay home for other people, those who will take care of those who are sick. And those who care for those, the bodies of those who are deceased. And on that note, I regret to, and, and with pain in my heart, to announce the death of our brother, Mr. Ratif. Mr. Ratif um, was a wonderful man. He attended um, the 4 p.m. masses on Saturday. He, he, he will always, always be there on Saturdays with his uh, daughter-in-law. And, some, and, and sometimes with his son, Kevin Radif. Um, Mr. Radif died after a, a brief illness. He was taken to the hospital a few days ago. And um, on Monday, he passed. And so we will continue to pray for him and his family. And as you all know, on Monday, we buried and we laid to rest another wonderful person not a wonderful, wonderful man um, who gave everything, who did everything for our church, Bobby Willis. Bobby died 15 days after his wife died. And so we, 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 our hearts are heavy. Uh, there's pain in our hearts, and, but we totally surrender to God. The God who is all-knowing, all-loving, the God who cares for us, even beyond our knowledge. And so I ask you now to please bow your heads now as we observe a moment of silence for these, our folks who have died recently, and for the many, the thousands and thousands of people who have died recently. Let us bow our heads now, and in silence, let us call upon our Heavenly Father. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Loving Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for all that you have done for us. There are grief in our hearts, the pain in our soul. But you know it all. For through it all, we have learned to depend on you. We have learned to put our trust in you. And so we ask you to watch over us and to guide us each and every day of our lives. Today, as we begin to celebrate your triduum, the most important days of our Christian faith, we ask that you come into our heart. Though we may not be physically present in your church, but we know that we, our body, is a temple of the Holy Spirit. For you tell us that we are indeed the body of Christ, your body. And so watch over us. And give us that same zeal, that same tenacity, that same joy that fills us even if we are present. And so as we celebrate today your word, the parable of the forgiven father, or like we say, the parable of the prodigal son. Teach us that it is because of your forgiveness that we are able to be here today. 
because of your love, because of who you are, we can withstand every trials and tribulations. And may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts, may they be acceptable to your sight, O Lord, through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, good evening again to you all. For those who are uh, just joining us now, um, we are studying Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And we will begin uh, from verse 11 to 32. Now I know many of us call this the parable of the prodigal son. But if you have heard me preach on this, I, 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 I try to stay away from um, calling it the parable of the prodigal son. I, I rather think it is the parable of the forgiven father. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's, there's nothing wrong with seeing it as a parable of the prodigal son. But I'm saying that because of my life, my personal experience, I think God's mercy is what has given us, led us thus far. And his mercy endures forever. And because his mercy endures forever, we are here today. We are alive today. We have been able to, thus far, stay alive. Not because we are beautiful or because we have money. Not because we, we are better off than the thousands and thousands of people who have died. No. We are simply here today because of God's mercy. And so we acknowledge that mercy that comes from the Lord. And because we acknowledge that mercy that comes from the Lord, we turn to him at all times. And that's what the story today will teach us. The story of the, the, the parable of, of the forgiven father or the parable of the prodigal son, whichever way you like, will teach us that God's mercy is what draws us to himself. So, background, a little background, you know, Last week, I told us that towards Jesus' own passion, his death, you know, his suffering, death, and resurrection that we're going to celebrate in the Triduum, he began, towards the end, began to teach his disciples in parables. He threw a lot of parables at them. He threw a lot of parables at them. Um, we talked about some of those parables, you know. As soon as he, he, he lamented over Jerusalem, then he began to teach them the cost of discipleship. You know, he would tell them the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and now the parable of the prodigal son or the forgiven father. Why is this passage today necessary? It is necessary because if God has not come to us, in the person of Jesus Christ, in the, who is the second person of the Trinity, we will not be able to sustain our life. We will not be able to return to God. Let me say that again. If God had not come down from heaven to earth, taken flesh, and was born of a woman, became man, became like us in all things except sin, if God himself had not come down. We will have been incapable of returning to God. That's why, you know, this story, this, this passage is chosen for us as we conclude uh, this beautiful season, as we enter into the Triduum. Just to a reminder for all of us, if God has not come down on earth, we would have been simply been incapable of returning to him. Now, how do we know that? Let's get deep in, into this story, the parable. Jesus now, verse 11, then Jesus said, that now he was teaching his disciples. Remember I told you he was throwing at them so many parables. Now this is one of those parables that he threw at them. Jesus now said to who? To the disciples and those who were listening to him. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the share 
of the property that will belong to me. Give me the share of the property that will belong to me. Now, what is the problem here? It is an abs absurd request. The father typically will divide his stocks and all he has with the hope that the sons would at least wait for him to die before they scramble over it. But no. This man had two sons. And the, the younger son came to the father and said, I need a share of my property. I mean, if somebody walks up to you and say, I need you to give me half of your property, and you are still hale and hearty and you are still bubbling, you, you will begin to think that there's some... Is he wishing me dead? You know, why will he be asking for his inheritance while I'm still alive? Because typically, in the Jewish tradition, as it is in so many cultures, you don't begin to inherit the property of your father until he is nowhere to be found, until he dies. So that's the first lesson we learn from here. That the son went to the father with an absurd, with a ridiculous request. But, let's read on. So, he divided his property between them. You catch that? Ridiculous request. But yet, the father says, okay. See, that's how God deals with us. Sometimes we come to him and we go down on our knees. Sometimes we don't even go down on our knees. We don't humble ourselves. But we come to him asking for certain things. Sometimes God allows us to be who we are. He gives us. But then, like every good father, and Jesus himself told us, and he said, you know, which, which among you will, will your son or your daughter come to them and ask for a fish and we will end up giving them a snake or an egg and we end up giving them a scorpion so so many critics uh, of this passage will say oh why did the father give him the property the father should have known that he was immature that he would have squandered it well sometimes God allows us to use our freedom that's why it's a freedom given to all of us you know we are not controlled by a remote, right? God did not create us and then, you know, subjects us to do whatever he desires. No. He knows what is good for us. He will give us what is good for us. But at the same time, there's such a thing called freedom. And it is that freedom that comes, that we perpetuate in our conscience that makes us choose between good and evil. So, and this story, the father obliged him. Now, the father didn't say to him, I'm giving you this property, half my property. You can go ahead and squander it. There's no way that the father said that. No. I, I didn't hear that. Did you? No, none of us did. But the father did anyway. So, let's read on. Verse 13. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country and there he squandered his property in dissolute living a few days later in other words this was not an accident so after the son had received the property he spent some time in other words he had some time to make a change he had some time to turn around and leave no what did he do he spent his time gradually preparing himself for what he was going to do in our relationship with God sometimes that's what we do intentionally we intentionally prepare ourselves that we're going to commit evil that sometimes that we have intentionally engage in evil actions we knew it was going to be hurtful but we knew it was going to be bad but yet even when our conscience continue to prick us and continue to pull us we still go ahead and do it anyway because there's always fun in sin 
right? So, after he had gathered his property, he left. He left town. You know, like we say in the street now, bye, Felicia. That's what he told his father. Bye. So he left. But then the Bible said, shortly after he left, he squandered that property that he had received from his father. Just, just, take, just take a moment and just think about this. We receive so much gift from God. We receive a lot from God. But yet, it doesn't take us a lot of time to squander them. We receive a lot of gift. Some of us have the gift of singing. But we squander them. Some of us have the gift of prayers. Some of us have the gift or even tongues. Some of us have the gift of healing. Yes, some of us have the gift of healing. Some of us have the gift of organizing. The gift of leadership. Some of us have, you know, the gift of just being a source of support to other people. But what do we do? Sometimes we are busy squandering all that the Lord has given us. We squander them. So, he went out. We don't utilize the gift like this prodigal son. Now, verse 14. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. A severe famine struck. Yeah, you know, things happen. You know, when, when he took his property and desired to run away and, and squander it, he wasn't hoping that it was going to finish. But it doesn't matter how much you have. It doesn't matter how much property you have accumulated. One day, it's going to finish. What did he did do wrong? He never invested. Did you notice that? He was just busy all day, all night, having himself a lot of fun. He was enjoying himself. <laughs> but then, severe famine broke out. You know, sometimes we, we never believe that we can actually go broke. Go broke physically, go broke spiritually. We never anticipate that it was going to happen to us. But sometimes it will. It does happen to the worst of us. It does happen to the best of us. So, what did he do when his luck ran out? So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to the field to feed the pigs. Now, let's just spend a moment on this portion of the passage. Now, this is a guy who obviously came from a wealthy family. His father was wealthy. But what did he do? He chose the streets rather than the home. He chose for himself. He chose to seek what's out there rather than prepare himself for a greater future ahead. But then we can give him kudos. At least when all was lost, what did he do? He hired himself out. At least he tried to do something. But he went from a prince to a nobody. See, when we begin to separate ourselves from God, it's so easy for us to go from a queen, a king, to a nobody. Simply because we have chosen to separate ourselves from God. So now he had to go and hire himself. And the worst part of this story is that where did he go to hire himself out? To somebody 
who was rearing pigs. Remember, we talked about it a few weeks ago. The, the Jewish idea and the Jewish concept of pigs. For the Jews, pigs are the worst. Pigs are horrible. They're dirty. You know, for them, the Jewish people, pigs are just, are just one of those animals that you don't want to associate yourselves with. Unclean. They regard pigs as unclean and one of those unclean animals. Now that's where this guy who was living a life of wealth, living a life of joy and peace, this was the rocket that had propelled this young man downward into a life of uh, uh, the worst piece of a life. One who rears peak. Now, another part of this verse 16 is that he ain't got nothing to eat. He has nothing to eat. Absolutely nothing to eat. He was hungry. So, he would gladly, verse 16, he would gladly have filled himself with the pots. Pig food. He would gladly have eaten pig food. He would gladly have, verse 16, he would gladly have eaten pig food. But yet, no one gave him anything to eat. Nobody gave him anything. How do you go from eating from a beautiful china to scrappling with pig food? The story of our lives sometimes. Now, keep in mind, we began this story by talking about three persons a father and two sons and while the story is going on i just want you to take a moment and reflect in yourself and figure out which of those three persons that you have predominantly found yourself right have you found yourself by the end of the story by the end of this story have you found yourselves mostly being the father who offers forgiveness or being the two sons and we're going to go into the other son in a short while so why the story is going on figure out for yourselves you know who have i been have i been the one that is always prodigal or have i been always the brother who could care less about the plight of his other brother so verse 17 but he came to his senses amen so now this is the good news right here this is the good news why is it the good news because he, he has been running he's been busy running he's been busy doing what was in his mind what he wanted to do he's been busy trying to leave and survive on his own where did that get him nothing he kept going down and down and down and that's us sometimes we think we can run this race without jesus we think we can run this race without god what happens to us we keep going down down and down so but then the, the beauty of this story is that he came to his senses he came to his senses verse 17 and then he said how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to eat and even to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. How many of us have said this, this words? Maybe not, not in the same terms. How many times have we said those words? Look at, look at all those who have given their life to Christ. See how happy they have been. They may not necessarily be the richest, but see how happy they have been. How many times have we said those words to ourselves and to people around us? How many, the boy said, you know, how many of my father's hired servants have they have enough bread even to spare? Well, here I am without nothing to eat. That's the reason for Lent. That metanoia, that U-turn, that turnaround, that 360 degrees of our faith that we make, that's the purpose of Lent. 
And that's the purpose of this Holy Week and this three dream that we will begin tomorrow. That's the purpose. For us, whatever you have found yourself, God is calling you, Jesus is calling you to make that 360 degrees. Turn around. Come to our senses. Turn around. Because we keep hitting the wall or hitting the brick. We're going nowhere without the Lord. But then we have to come to our senses and turn around. And then when he said that, he now gave one of the most beautiful words that you and I should be given. Every time you find yourself that you have gone away from the Lord, I think this is one of the most important words that we will say. I will get up and go to my father. Amen, somebody. I think every time you find yourself lost, that's what we should be saying. I will get up. I will rise. Yes, I shall arise and return to my Father. Yes, when we come to our senses, you know, whenever we have gone astray from the Lord, when we think that we, we have lost it all, yes, I will arise, I will return to my Father. And not just return to the Father and do nothing. Verse 18 continues. I will say to my Father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Did you see that message right there? He didn't try to, you know, sweet talk his Father. <laughs> he didn't try to play, oh well, you know, it wasn't all my fault. He wasn't trying to play and push and kick the can ahead. He wasn't trying to trying to just you know, sneak out and act like nothing happened. See, that's what we do to God. When we refuse to go to confession, I say this again, church, when we refuse to go to confession, especially now we can go to confession during this period because we have received indulgence but after we all of this is over we're still called to go back to that sacrament but when we knowingly without anything holding us back without corona keeping us at home when we knowingly refuse to go to confession that's precisely what we're doing we're trying to play the blame game and trust me God is not interested in that. God is only interested in those who come to him with a sincere heart. And that's what he did. Return to the Lord. Isn't that how we began this season of Lent that ended up into this Holy Week? Isn't that how we started with the prophet Joel? Return to the Lord. Isn't that what the first word from Scripture that we read on Ash Wednesday, return to the Lord. That's what. That's why this passage is important for us. I will return to the Father. And when I return to the Father, I'm not going to try to exonerate myself. I'm not going to try to play the good guy, good cop, bad cop. No, I'm going to take ownership. When we go to confession, when we confess our sins to the Lord, we are taking ownership. And that's the first step to reconciliation with God. You have to take ownership for what you have done. It's not them. It's not us against the world. Take ownership. Oh, she made me do. What was the first problem we had with Adam and Eve? That God had with Adam and Eve. What did Adam say? Oh, that woman made me do it. Hand washed. No woman makes you do what you don't want to do. No man makes you do what you don't want to do. That's why in the law, you know, if you are an accomplice, you are equally guilty. So, when we return to the Lord, we return wholeheartedly. We take ownership. I, I, I love, I love the way he put it. He didn't go, he didn't mix words. 
says, I will return to my father. And I will say to my father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I have sinned against heaven and against you. And then, beautiful words, he now goes on to say, verse 19, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So, treat me like you would treat any hired servant. In other words, he recognized that he had lost his position. The prodigal son recognized, even in his sinful nature, he recognized that he needed to do a metanoia, a change of heart. And when he does that metanoia, he's not wishing for God to place him in the same pedestal that he had always been. Just anything lower will be fine, so says the prodigal son. That's the kind of attitude that God wants from us. That's the attitude that God himself wants from us. Okay? No blame them. Just take ownership. And you'll be fine with the Lord. So, after he has said all this good stuff, what did he do? Verse 20, so he set off and went to his father. Now, it's, it's okay to admit that we are wrong, but it's not enough. Admitting that we are wrong is just a first step. It's not an end in itself. You know, supposing you have hurt somebody and you say, oh, okay, and you sit in your home and you realize, oh, woo, I really did somebody bad. Oh, I really cut that woman off. I really flipped them the bird. You know, I really cussed my niece and my nephew out. I really did this, I really did that. Yeah, recognition, yeah. But trust me, it's not enough. Every recognition has to be accompanied by an action. I repeat that. Every recognition of an offense must be accompanied by an action. Because that action is what God himself is looking for. That's what God is looking for. That action. Yes, he wants us to recognize our frailty and to take ownership. But then, after you have done that, what happens? So, the prodigal son teaches us, so he set off. But this is the reason, this, this statement I'm going to make now is the reason why I decided to change, for me, to change this parable into uh, the parable of the forgiven father. Because even though he recognizes that he has offended God or his father, even though he made a metanoia and he had made an attempt to return to the father, but the second part of verse 20 says, but while he was still far off, his father saw him and his father filled with compassion, he ran and put his hands around him and kissed him. Ta-da! the parable of the forgiven father. So, let me, let me take a, a few minutes here. It's not him. Yes, he had to do what he has to do. He had to recognize his fault. He had to make that attempt. But it's not him. Who? The father has always been looking for. The moment the son went through those doors and left on his voyage, the father stood out of his way, looking for him, waiting for him, and longing for him to return. That's the summary of the season of Lent and Holy Week. It's not us. We can do whatever we want, but the father, God our father, is always, always, always looking out and waiting for us to return. You know, I was preaching about this one day and I, I gave an analogy, you know, with an African culture, specifically the Igbo culture in Nigeria. And I told folks, I said, a typical Igbo man 
a typical evil father, when his son has offended him, he sits on his bench, on his chair, on his recliner, whatever it is. He sits there, and the, the son is the one that should come to him and pay homage. Typical. And I know in so many cultures, it's the same way. A father, ask anybody who works in the evil culture, a father never stands up to greet his son. Not even when the son is this wayward and has stolen from him and has, you know, destroyed the father's fortune. A father typically will not get up and go to the son. The son is the one who should come all the way prostrate before the father and then offer any kind of apology he wants to offer. But this is the beauty of God. God is not even waiting for us to come all the way. He already sent his only begotten son ahead. And he says, all you got to do is listen to that begotten son and you will be reconciled with me because after creation through our ancestors Adam and Eve we lost our communication with God we lost our friendship with God we lost our union with God the only way we can get it back is by Jesus coming suffering dying and rising by doing that by this tradition we can now return to the Father. And while we're even returning to the Father, the Father will be out there waiting for us. That's the reason why this, for me, is a parable of the forgiven Father. So the Father welcomed him and kissed him and embraced him. You know, I made a joke I, uh, a couple of uh, times when I preached on this parable. I said, you know, if I'm the father, I'm not hugging him. I'm not kissing him. I don't know where that mouth has been. I don't know where that body has been. I don't know how long you've taken a shower. I don't know where you've been. I'm not doing any of that. You know, I may forgive him. I may stay. But that's who we are. You know, don't judge me. You know, you could have done the same thing too. You know, don't you see how we stay away from each other as a result of the coronavirus? Mm -hmm. I would have treated him coronically, right? Like he had some corona, you know what I'm saying? I love you, but you gotta stay over there, six feet, and coming back and kissing you and doing none of that. But God overlooks everything, and that's the gospel message, that God is willing to overlook everything that we have done and everything that we have found ourselves. God is so willing to overlook all our frailties, that he will step away from his throne and come and give us a heart and hold us and kiss us. For a Jewish man, for a Jewish man to kiss his son, that's a sign of deep love. You know how it is with us men. You know, you don't want to kiss no man in, in the public before people start thinking you play for another team, you know. But the father... Ignored everything. Went up there, gave his son a kiss. Outside, with the servants watching. As a sign of the deep love that God had. On Friday, you will hear another word where we the kiss is important. Judas will come out, as we heard on Sunday, Palm Sunday. Judas will betray Jesus with a kiss. A kiss is an intimate way of showing affection. For Judas to walk up to Jesus and kiss Jesus in the midst of all those folks show that there is a deep relationship, a deep love that exists. But yet, we know that Judas' own kiss was a kiss of betrayal. But this father's kiss was a kiss of welcome, a kiss of want, a kiss that says, I accept you back into my life, irrespective of what you have done. That kiss is what Jesus offers us 
every single day when we go into the confessional. When the priest raises his hands and grants us and gives us that absolution, that's the kiss of Jesus Christ. That's what it means. And so if you ever want to receive that kiss from Jesus, the kiss that the Father gave the Son, the kiss that Jesus will give us, go to confession. And as soon as those hands are raised upon you and, and that prayer of absolution is offered to you, that's the Lord God kissing you and saying, I welcome you back, my daughter. I welcome you back, my son. You belong to me, not to the enemy. And so we continue. Verse 22. But the father said to the slaves, quickly bring out the robes, the best one, and put a ring on his finger and a sandal on his feet. Let, let's go through those three things. What the father gave him. The first, put out a robe. That's what the Lord does to us. He robes us with a garment of joy and peace. That's the first thing that occurs to us whenever we return to the Lord. We are clothed. Isn't St. Paul right when he says, you know, all those who believe in God are clothed. They are clothed in the, in, in the Lord. Those who are baptized. Whenever all of us, when we are baptized, we are clothed in the Lord. That's why that's the symbol of the cloth that you receive. The white cloth you receive when you are baptized, even as a baby. Even when we die. That's the symbol of the pall that is placed over our casket. Those who are clothed in the Lord. If you are baptized, you are clothed in the Lord. That's the symbolism. That's the first thing the Father did. Yes, this guy is dead, was dead, but now I'm going to place upon him the robe of life. And then the second thing the Father offered him, put a sandal on his feet. Yeah, put a sign up. He's been walking waywardly. Put some protection underneath him. Faith. The church puts on a sandal of, of faith upon us and offers us that sandal of faith. So that whenever we walk, as long as we are wearing our faith in God like a sandal, we will be protected lest our feet be harmed. And then my third analogy here is that. He said, put a, a ring on his finger. You know? Even Beyonce said, you know, if you, if you love it, you know, put a ring on it, right? This is the father telling us that, I love you. I put a ring. A ring for the Jewish people and to us, even in the church. A ring is a sign of authority. You ever wondered why? The couple during marriage ex 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 exchange rings. They are saying to one another, I give you authority over my life. I give you authority to journey with me in this life. A ring is a sign of authority. So that authority that is lost by waywardness, by transgression, the father puts back and re returns. Remember the son says, I'm not worthy to be even close to being your son. Just treat me like you would treat your servant. But the father said, oh, come on. Forget that. Servant? No. I'll put a ring in your finger. See? What a beautiful thing that the father did. And then, for all those of us who eat meat, those of you who don't eat meat, I'm sorry. The father did Another uh, important gesture to show that he is totally welcoming this son. He asked quickly, you know, put a robe, the best one, put a ring on his fingers, put a sandal on his feet. And then verse 23, and get the fattened calf and kill it. Now, this is where a trouble will rise, right? Now, he was supposed to be, the prodigal son was supposed to be sitting himself down and fattening this calf, right? That was his job as a son. But he done left his job. He
he left his role, he left his position, and decided to go mingle with all the stuff that he wanted to mingle with. And now he comes back, and the father says, the fattened calf that he refused to tender, go bring it, the best one. See, my brothers and sisters, when we return to the Lord, God gives us the best of everything. The best of everything. Ah, no, 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 not the, not, you know, some, some kind, you know, a little bit, no. God loves us so much that he is willing to give us the best of everything. And that's the good news. And he showed that best by giving his only son, his only begotten son, the best of himself, is the one who died that he may have life. So, the servant did that the father has ordered. And then celebration happened. Yeah, I'll tell you, these folks are like, you know, like they are. They are from Southeast Washington, D.C. because they, they know how to throw a party because the party was loud. Verse 25. Now, his eldest son was in the field. You all remember? Remember the man had two sons, right? We spent all this time talking about the one son that left. We haven't said anything about the other son, right? Now, Let's, let's look into the other son. And keep in mind uh, the analogy I gave you. The three characters of this passage, the father, the prodigal son, and the other brother, look into your life and figure out where you find yourself more. Some of us will piggyback from one to the other. And that's okay. But what is the dominant character in your life? What here will be the dominant character in your life? So, let's, let's read about this other son. Maybe it will help us to be able to answer the questions. So, now, his elder brother, he was older, because, you know, younger ones are always acting stupid. The older one was in the field, and he came and approached the house. And as he approached the house, he heard music. And dancing. Mm -hmm. That's why I said these people must be from Southeast Washington, D.C. They know how to throw a party because it's loud. So he was not in the house, but he could hear all the music, all the dancing. He could hear everything. So rather than come in and see for himself, what did he do? He stood outside and he called one of the slaves and asked what was going on? Did you see that? He called one of the slaves. He didn't want to go inside. Why did you think he didn't want to go inside? Perhaps he knew that the only thing that will make his father rejoice, the only thing that will make his father throw such a huge party, is when his father sets his eyes on the lost son. He knew that. I guarantee you, he knew that. Because if there had been loud parties since this other son left, oh, he would have thought, oh, that's normal. But there was something abnormal about this celebration. And that's why I say that God is willing. God doesn't mind going all out for us, for you and I. Throwing a big party for us. Because that's how much love he has for us. He doesn't mind giving us the best of robes, the best of sandals, put a ring on our fingers, a sign of authority, and kill the fattened calf because of the love he has for us. So this son, number one, knew that the only thing that will raise such a party, that's why he didn't want to go in. He was already prejudiced. He was already prejudiced. Yes. So he didn't go in. He called for the servant. And he asked, you know, and the servant replied, he replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he got him back safe and sound. 
The servant went all in and told him, yeah, yes, that's it. The father, your father, has killed the fattened calf because your brother has come back. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's see what transpired after this. Verse 28. Then he became angry and refused to go in. Have you ever, folks, have you ever acted angrily towards other people who have received blessings from God? That's food for thought. That's, that's something that we need to seriously reflect on. Have you ever been angry when God does something great, remarkable, in the life of somebody else? And because it's not yours, have you ever, have you ever felt that kind of jealousy? You know, there was a, a story of a of a friend who, you know, got so jealous that her girlfriend who had cancer eventually recovered. She was in the hospital for a long time. And when she came home, the husband threw a party and this girl, who's supposed to be the best friend, refused to attend. Why? Because she wasn't hoping for her to return alive. She wasn't waiting, for, she wasn't hoping for her to return alive. She was hoping that the girlfriend who had cancer would die so that she can, you know, go over and grab her husband and be married to, to the husband. I'm kidding you, it's not a story, it's from BET, and I've watched a couple of it lately, you know. But that's a movie. It, it, it may sound like a movie. But in reality, sometimes that's who we are. We become so angry that God blesses other people. We don't want to participate like the young lady. You know, she will come to the hospital and visit her friend who had cancer, bring her flowers, bring her food, and pray with her, hallelujah, Jesus, God bless you. And when she recovered and came home, and the husband called the neighbors and said, come, let's celebrate my wife has been healed of cancer, the best friend refused to come. And so that's exactly what the son did. But he refused to come. He became angry and refused to come in. And here the father goes again. But his father came out and began to plead with him. Verse 28. Didn't I just tell you that God loves us so much that he doesn't mind going all out? For us, right? The father knew that his other son was angry, was resentful. His other son was immature. His other son was jealous. So the father went out. And the father went in, out, out and met him. And, and then the father pleaded with him to come in. Verse 29. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years, that's, that's how come we knew that the prodigal son left and spent a couple of years. Because the Bible tells us so. He said, for all these years, I've been working like a slave for you. And I have neither disobeyed your command. Yet, you have neither given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. Verse 30. But when this, this son of yours, did you catch that? Not when my brother. See how anger, how resentment can lead us. The son didn't say, when my brother returned. What did he say? When this son of yours, in other words, for the older brother, the prodigal son has lost his son's cred, right? You know how we lose our street credibility, street cred? For this older brother, the son has lost his cred, his son's cred, his brother cred. 
That cra- and, and sometimes we, we have taken away the cred of other people. The Christian cred we have taken from people because they've done, done something wrong. Maybe they have lived a life of dissipation, a life of drug addiction, a life of prostitution, a life of jealousy, or they have lived a life of deceitfulness. And so because of that, what do we do? We are quick to withdraw people's cred. And that's what the brother did. Even after the father pleaded with him, he was still arguing with the father. You didn't give me a young calf. Well, the father don't have to give you. You have a young calf. If you had wanted it, you would have gone to the father and said, Hey, daddy, um, I, I want to have a party with my friends. Can I get a lamb so I can make some barbecue? He could have asked. You didn't ask. Right? The Bible says to us, you know, you receive not because you ask not. And even when you ask, you don't ask in the right way. So he never asked. So he's acting like the, the father denied him an opportunity to celebrate. God never denies us an opportunity to celebrate. God never denies us an opportunity to celebrate. Right? He never asked. And if you don't ask, you ain't getting. But the father now answered him. Verse, no, verse 30. But when this son of yours came back, you devoured the property. Who devoured the property with prostitutes? And yeah, he goes back again and relieving the brother's mistakes. Now, I wanted to point something out. As I see we're running out of time. But I wanted to point something out there. You know, sometimes we Christians, we are quick to begin to point out other people's mistakes. It's easy for us to point an accusing finger at other people. Oh, he went out and did this, he did that, he did that. Remember, the father was the one who was offended. The son stole his property and left. But when he returned, the father didn't go around and keep relieving this litany of sins that the son had. But the brother did. So, he kept on going and on and on and on in verse 31. Then the father said to him, My son, you are always with me, and all I have is yours. All I have, everything I have is yours. God has given us everything that he has. He has given us his joy, his peace, his life. He has given us everything. All I have is yours. All you got to do is ask. And if you ask in the right way, you will receive. Isn't that what Matthew tells us? Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock. And the doors will be opened unto you. For whoever asks receives. Whoever seeks finds. Whoever knocks has the door open for them. All I have is yours. Just ask. And then finally, verse 32. Then the father continues to say, But we have to celebrate and rejoice. Because... This brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Amazing grace. Amazing love of God. Amazing peace that we receive from God. Amazing forgiveness that we get from our loving God. A God who is willing to leave his throne a God who left his throne and came to die for us. He came that we may have life. A God who doesn't care where we have been, where our lips have been, our mouth, our body has been. A God who comes and hugs us and holds us and embraces us and kisses us. A God who doesn't relieve our sins in front of us. 
a God who is willing to forgive, who is slow to anger and rich in compassion. That's the God you are going to encounter in the tree doom. From him giving us tomorrow the most important sacrament, himself in the Eucharist. A God who will die on the cross for sinners, even while those he saved, those he healed, those he rescued, those he brought to life, those he fed, mock and jeer at him. Yet he's still willing to die for them. A God who will come back to life on Easter Vigil, who will raise on the third day, a God who will encounter and sing hallelujah on Easter day. That's the God who today is a forgiven father. And I pray that you will encounter him during this most beautiful of triduum in this holy week. Amen. All right, now, um, for those of us who have a question, um, uh, I will give, um, if you give me another three, five minutes so I can answer a few questions if you have any. And um, before we do the closing prayer and we depart for today. Okay, let me try and un unmute those who are on the phone. All participants are muted. All participants are unmuted. All right, folks, um, those on the conference call, Anybody have a question? As I'm waiting for those who, those who have a, uh, you have a question? Okay. Oh yes, we did study um, Luke's Gospel, chapter eleven, chapter fifteen. I'm sorry, Luke chapter fifteen, verses. 11 to 32. Yes. Okay. Thank you all. Any other question? Uh, okay. If you don't have a question, I have a... Yes, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. It's it's it, um, it, 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 it has nothing to do with the sun. It has everything to do with us, men, women, boys, and girls. It is the parable of. of you see, that's why I stayed away with the parable of the prodigal son. I, I rather I, I targeted the parable of the forgiven father. Because all of us, all of us, no matter who we are, we have encountered the Lord's forgiveness. And we will, we will encounter more of that forgiveness as we journey with him during this holy week, as we enter the triduum. So yes, it, it's a parable for the daughters, for those who are on the Facebook Live. She was asking, can we transpose this to the, the parable of the lost daughter? Of course, absolutely yes. There's so many daughters out there who, are, who have been lost. That need to be found by the Lord. Amen, somebody. Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay. So uh I don't have any any question. One more one more question before we go. Yes. Uh, okay, let me go into um some of the housekeeping. Tomorrow we have um we have the celebration of the institution of the Eucharist, right? Uh, Holy Thursday at 7 o'clock, all right? 7 p.m. And uh, we, you can call in as well as uh, you can uh, watch the Mass and participate in the Mass um, via the Facebook Live, just like we've been doing, okay? Now, I have a question. Somebody, somebody uh, brought to my attention um, this issue that is going around um, of the three, uh, uh, five, five D, 
and all of that. There's so many people who have been, oh, there's uh, 4G and 5G and all of this stuff. Um, just a piece of advice to all of us. And I, I am, I'm also um, keeping this advice for myself too. I, I, please do not be the bearer of bad news. Do not be the bearer of what? Of bad news. There are so many fake and so many untrue things in the internet. People will keep sending you stuff about 5G this and 5G that. You know, to be honest with you, folks, you know, we are, we are going through a lot. We don't have to increase our worries right now. I don't know about you. There's so much on the heart. You know, we're dealing with so many things. So please, do not be the bearer of bad news. If, there's, if there is a conspiracy about 5G, we will deal with that later on, right? Let, our focus right now, our focus right now is to stay safe, and keep our health workers safe, keep our grocery store workers safe, uh, uh, all the places we go to, the bank, all the folks who work, keep them safe. So why am I saying this is that I know so many people, they will send you all kinds of stuff on the internet. You can, you can read all you can, but do me a favor, don't send it to anybody else. Because you don't know what that person is going through. People, you know, the devil, are, the devil is using a lot of people and disseminating wrong and false information. There's so many false information over there. We don't have to deal with 5G nonsense. When people are dying. Well, well, there's a conspiracy that, you know, there's a folks... Uh, you know, and China, and then the, the, the reason why Corona is in here is because they're, they're trying to institute 5G, who gets 5G first, and 5G this. I don't even try to, to read up on all of that because I think it's not necessary. So I'm only saying to all of us, please, when you receive, the only information you should be sending people, when you receive information, the only thing you should be sending people is words of prayer. Something that will strengthen them. Send people only positive things that will strengthen them. Not some, something that will depress them or not. I don't know about you. Depression is high. So don't be the bearer of bad news. Don't increase somebody's pain and somebody's worry by telling them about all of these 5G nonsense. Okay? So don't, don't let them use you. Don't let them use you because they are looking for those they will use. They are looking for folks they will use. Don't let them use you. Only thing you will send to anybody in your, in your mail, and don't send to me. If you send to me, I'm going to send you some, some sweet words too. Don't send to me. You know, you know, don't send me all of that stuff. Uh, the only thing I want to hear from today onward is a happy birthday and I'm praying for you and stay strong. That's all I want to get from you. No 5G nonsense. All right? Yes. Tomorrow is my birthday. Tomorrow is my birthday, so that's why I'm wearing one of my best shirts. You know, don't hit the player, I hit the game, right? <laughs> I'm a son of a lion, okay? My father was a lion because he fought for justice and peace, so I am following in that footsteps. So thank you all. Thank you so much. It's been a fun evening. I know you got to go. Amen. I know you all got to go uh, and cook dinner. So let us now um, bow our heads as we pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And together let us say the prayers that our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. Together, our Father, who art in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
Merciful God, we thank you for today. We thank you for our brothers and sisters. We thank you for the word of God that you have fed us. We ask that you help us so that we, even when we find ourselves as the prodigal daughters, as the prodigal sons, that we would return to you, that we will return to you and receive your healing mercy and your forgiveness. For all our brothers and sisters, those who hurt, those who have no way to return to the Father, Lord, we ask that you open the, the doors of our hearts so that we can lead them to you. Give us the grace to always love you and serve you all the days of our lives. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And the Lord be with you. And now may Almighty God bless you and keep you safe, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, go in peace. Thank you all. Remember, tomorrow, 7 p.m., and then on Friday, we have Sessions of the Cross. Friday, we have Session of the Cross at 2 p.m., and then the Celebration of the Lord's Passion at 3 p.m. All right? God bless you all. All right. God bless you all.